Shopify grows your business no matter how far or big you grow. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Whether you're selling your fans' next favorite shirt or an exclusive piece of podcast merch, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Allbirds, Rothy's, Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash income, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash income now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. You're walking on lot and it's the third day of the festival. And you see the coolest shirt and you're like, I never seen anything like that. Where'd you get that, bro? Shop tour bus. Why would you say it like that? Online? Because you, like, yeah, I'll do I, that. you know what? If somebody yeah. asked me on lot, that's how I would say it. Okay. That's I cool. I would totally say you it. You like should that. go over to shop tour bus and check out all the dope designs that they have. They are grateful dead inspired t-shirts that have the song titles told in picture on them. In the most comfortable fabric you will ever feel. That stuff is super soft. And they come in a hand design, one of a kind box with all kinds of extras on the inside. And some of you might even get a Grateful Dead cassette bootleg miracle in your box. That's right. That is some heady shit right there. That's a cool package to receive. I'm just saying. I mean, I don't know of a more heady You're just like going along your average day. You reach in the mail. Boom. You pop out this cool box. And it's a surprise from somebody that loves you, that knows about Shop Tour Bus, well, you knows you like them. cool shit. No, this is a present. Oh, okay. They reach in, see this box, open it up, and then they get a freaking bootleg. They pull out their secret cassette player from, they don't even remember 1974. where. 1974. Put in that cassette and like, oh shit, my friend went to this show. And starts listening, you starts dancing. You put on your dancing. shirt and, and the whole thing happens. Can you Just imagine? Smoke a joint. Can you it's just on. imagine? Go to shoptourbus.com and when you do, put in the promo code No, no Simple, Simple Road. Road, all one word, and you're going to get free shipping from the family over at Shop Tour Bus. Some of you are headed out into the great beyond out there in the wider world to go see shows at venues you've never been to before. And wouldn't it be cool if like somebody could give you the lowdown on all of that? Heck yeah, because when we went to the Sphere, we didn't have any intel. No. The only intel we had was that what we remembered from Vegas, but we had no idea about this venue, Mm -mm. how they let people in, that you could get there from the certain casino or not. We didn't know. But you know what? Let me tell you something. What? Go over to VenueLama.com and they have all the inside info on all the venues over there. And it's from... Well, not all. Well, a lot lot. of the inside info on a lot of the venues. Sorry. There you go. Uh, And the info that's up there is from all of us. So it's the fans making the information that's important to us available on VenueLama.com. Stuff like, you know, the security dicks at that venue. Does the water stations not exist at that venue? Can you bring a bag or a chair? Or where can I go eat after or before the show? What's the lot scene like? Those kind of things that are important to folks like us that love to go to shows. Over at VenueLama.com. Yeah. You can quickly rate venues and share various tips and intel about those places. And you can go over there and sign up for your free Llama account and start rating and sharing your insider venue info today. Check this out. Llamas can also list their favorite scene-friendly businesses, websites, or podcasts on the hey, Venue Llama podcast page. So you could be like, yo, I love going to the Sphere and No Simple Road Rules. You could say something like that. You could. What else could they say? Uh, I love going to... Red Rocks and Best Show Ever is my favorite podcast. That that would be such an easy, cool thing to say. <laughs> easy. Just it would take it no time. It just kind of falls off the lips. And it yep. fe- you already feel that way. <laughs> right. I also, can I just say, Venue Llama, so much better than going to like Reddit for like your oh, yeah. like venue news. Because, you know, anything flies on there and you, get, you have to weed through some weird so venue llama, it feels like you're talking to fans about the the venue you're going to. Right, makes you right. feel better. Totally. Okay. So new venue anxiety. Don't you want to feel better? Don't you want to have less venue anxiety? Go yeah. to venuellama.com. Sign Come up on. for your free llama account. <laughs> anxiety free, show going, 
just for you. VenueLama.com. No simple road. Yeah, here we go. I know the road may seem to go on forever and a lifetime. We don't know what the fuck we're doing. Hell yeah. No, we don't. No. We, we're we just, we're winging it all the time. Winging it. Yep. <clears throat> hey now, No Super Road family, this is Aaron. Oh, hey, it's Mel. It's Cam. It, that's the wait, other what? apple. It's Your the- other <laughs> apple. Oh, I'm other apple. Yeah. It's other apple. And everything. <laughs> and everything. It's other apple. <laughs> um, so yeah, as you can tell, other apple is here, which is Cam Hurt from the Best Show Ever podcast. Apple is um, at He's work. Working. So he, I'm going to give you the, the long story. Uh, Apple was working till late at night tonight and I have to get the show out ready for tomorrow. And so Apple said, why don't you have Cam sit in my spot and you guys could do the intro so that you're not up until three o'clock in the morning editing everything and everything until tomorrow <laughs> for today. And I was like, okay, someone's got to work around here. So here we are. Yeah. I mean, Someone's gotta go just we can't just weed. go to fairs and <laughs> festivals and no one works. Um, the guest on No Simple Road this week is none other than the illustrious the, the Eric Davis. And Eric is a writer, scholar, journalist, and public speaker whose writings have ranged from rock criticism to cultural analysis to creative explorations of esoteric mysticism. And he is the author of of this fantastic new book. It's called Blotter, the untold story of an acid medium. Uh, Yeah, this is, this is like the smallest facet of Eric Davis. Yeah. By the way, it's just one of the things he's done, but it's a very, I I mean, just looking through that book for 10 seconds, it's a very cool book. Yeah. And it's very (laughs) comprehensive on something that generally cannot be comprehensive. Well, yeah, I mean, just just, by its nature, it's secretive. It's spread out. You don't really admit to taking these kinds of things in public spaces, depending on where you're at. Mm -hmm. So like to even gather all the information needed to have a comprehensive book is pretty incredible. Yeah, I would say incredible feat. There, there's several histories of the drug LSD, but to think to create a book on the medium that the drug is delivered upon is pretty meta. Very meta. That's very, very cool. Very niche, if you will. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Could be long and strange. Um, Eric, also, I didn't know this prior to, to speaking to him. He's also a deadhead. And like long time deadhead. Hey, man, you're making the blotter book. The, uh, true. Yes. I'm guessing. I There's true. Some you know what? I didn't even think about a show <laughs> or two. Yeah. Uh, and just an, a really cool guy. A, another yeah, thing cool. um, he has done slash is doing is um, help to found the Berkeley Alembic, um, which is like kind of like a meditation center. He said he doesn't know how to cla- describe it. Yet. Well, it's like a institute, but not. It's a center, but not. But it's not only that. And there's lots of different types of teaching. So, you know, like if you go to yoga studio, it's going to be pretty packed with yoga. Um, I would hope so. There's That's not a lot do. of, maybe you'll catch a chi, you know, Qigong class here or there, but like there's different types of movement, like static dance and like all these different types of meditations, Eastern and Western. Right. So, Alembic has like merged all of it includes art includes mysticism and neuroscience. I mean, everybody who is interested in spirituality and has a way or some kind of method or even are just interested in learning. This is where they go. Yeah. Wow. And I mean, it's pretty incredible. The, he, the Like Alison Gray is on the board on the board, you know, like one of yeah. the, yeah. So he's got a lot of really amazing people um, involved in this project and, I want to go to a class. You, yeah. I, I mean, you that are in Berkeley are pretty, um, pretty stoked. You can go to his website. It's technosis.com. That's T E C H G N O S I S.com. And that's got all of his writing and his books. And there's a link to his sub stack there. And there's some, um, 
I think he said there was, there's, there's some Grateful Dead essays on his oh, Substack yeah. too. He did Bernie. one on Eyes of the World. Um, this is another um, uh, Berkeley Alembic, A-L-E-M-B-I-C dot org. So that's where you can find out. He's also got um, a link to a Substack. He's got the people who founded the Alembic and all that. And, and it's also a great way to see his work too. And I know I've said this many a time in intros to no simple road episodes, but I, in recent memory, this is one of my, this is my favorite episode that we've done. Seriously. It was pretty incredible. I didn't want to stop talking to him. Like this is, this guy knows everything about all the stuff we love well, and, and is a scholar of all of yes. them. Very cool guest, guys. Yeah, And, and even Apple was like, I w- he invited him back even before yeah, we Yeah, we weren't even done yet. He's like, we want to have you back welcome on. Welcome back. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like to, we could take that new conversation we'll have with Eric in the future in a completely different direction because we didn't talk about any, he's like into culture and all different we types. Even of, talk, we didn't talk about magic. We didn't we talk didn't about talk religion. About yeah, none of it. None of that it, stuff. it was, so I'm looking forward to, uh, follow up to there, this one there is an easter egg in this episode i there's a part of this is there's a discussion about the the steal your face oh mm-hmm. and eric literally changed the way that i interpret the steal your face for the rest of my life that's crazy right that's, yeah wild that logo so, means so much right and and i mean obviously that thing can mean a lot of things and it's 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 right behind you right now. Yeah, it's right there behind my head. It means a lot of stuff and it you know, it changes depending on the day and the planets and what position the sun is in and all that stuff, but like I think he might have hit the nail on the head with this one. Well, well there's yeah. a couple like I didn't write a lot cuz I really was engrossed in the conversation, but a couple of things that I wanted to <laughs> share. One of my favorite things was um and this is from my little writings of the interview. <laughs> CIA fucks with shit. That's true. That's one of the truest statements has never been said. And playful and mischievous, and institute of illegal images. (laughs) Okay. All right. So I don't know. Those are some fun little things for you to pay attention to. So we're going to stop talking about the thing that you're about to listen to while you're already listening to us talk about the thing. You know. Yeah. And it's good. People love it. Do the business. And then <laughs> people <you're> love it, Aaron. <laughs> Stop. People love hearing you talk, Aaron. Don't talk about yourself like that. Don't right. talk about my friend Let Aaron it be. like that. Sorry, Cam. Thanks. Um, so you, you mean second Apple, Aaron. Oh, yes. Yeah, How's he apple. gonna get it right if you can't Sorry, get it right? Second apple. And everything. <laughs> um so follow No Simple Road at No Simple Road on all the social media platforms. Social and social. Social, <laughs> which is different than social. Go to <laughs> www.nosimpleroad.com and um, you know. Do website stuff there. You can surf there's dude. a newsletter and merch and tarot the web. And all the things that Mel and I do there too. And uh, if you are interested in uh, psychedelic um, journeys, there's a link up there for myself wellness. You can get in touch with them and That's they do right. ketamine therapy and all kinds of fun stuff that you can go. They've also started a podcast and they are really active on their um, Instagram page. So if you are not a part of their, um, of, you know, just click that link just because it's dope. Follow They've it. got, yeah, yeah, follow it. They've got cool do, stuff going do on. Do the thing. Do the thing. Uh, go <laughs> to patreon.com forward slash No Simple Road. That's how you support No Simple Road. The show does cost a dollar a month, but nobody's minding the store. It is the honor system here at No Simple Road. So I urge you to be honorable folks and go over to Patreon and sign up for like a buck. And then we get super happy and we continue to do No Simple Road and you get episodes. You understand how capitalism works. The whole thing I'm, keeps moving. Right. And yes. shaking. And and doing the thing. Uh, that you also, with the dollar or whatever, you get like ad free and day early of the releases. You get Connor's picks. You get uh, Sax's picks. You get my picks. You get Apple's stuff that he, when he decides to do something for us over there, Mel stuff. Well, you know, you were doing a tarot card of the day. I was doing a tarot card of the day. 
and that no, magic not. word is was. Was. Okay, cool. <laughs> and so that, yeah, you can experience all that wonder, magic, and mystery over at Patreon. Because you never know what you're going to get. No Simple Road. You can also call 971-808-1524. That is the No Simple Road tepid line. You have three minutes to say whatever the fuck you want. You can say all kinds of stuff. You can be like, this is my recipe for the week. You could be like, dude, my dog is so cute. Let me tell you a couple things. You could be like, hey. My stomach hurts. I'm going to Mondo Green, but I don't really want to go because I want to stay in my new house. You could tell us that. <laughs> Anything you want. And then when you hear yourself on the show, you're like, oh my God, that's, my, that, that's me. Yeah. yeah. I know what that's like. <laughs> yeah. I've done that. Yeah, me too. It was so. nice. Uh, and then, um, what else? What am I missing? Oh, you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts because that'd be really sweet <gasps> of you if you listen one? to the show. Ooh, we yeah. don't. I checked yesterday. You did? How, no. What if somebody did today? Well, then I'm wrong. Um, I've been wrong, wrong a lot of times in the past. I'll be wrong again in the future. And I'm riffing until you pull well, up the I'm, thing. I'm doing uh, trying the, really the hard goodest to just job that I possibly can, but you know I'm not I, even you know on the right thing. I used to do okay. for my friend's podcast? I used to, um, I changed my handle on Apple Podcasts to Mark Hurt LCL Football, like my dad's name, and would leave reviews as my dad and i would be like this is a great podcast too much cursing you know <laughs> yeah this is i'm gonna uh, start doing that for nothing new. no nothing new so you could be our july review july. go over there and leave a review on apple podcast or spotify <laughs> or whoever the hell you're listening to us on because that helps be, other people find out leave it as your dad pretend you're your dad <laughs> leave it as my dad leave it as Aaron's yeah. dad that'd be great um and then last but not least the absolute most important thing that we're asking all of you to do all the other stuff doesn't really i mean well it, it matters. all matters in the grand scheme of consciousness and and us continuing going forward but if you told someone about no simple road especially about your favorite episode you just send it to them don't even say anything just send it be like here check this podcast out bro. and then that's so sweet because that person be like oh my god that is so sweet i love that episode too what else do they talk about and then they may go down the no simple road rabbit hole and like it yeah <laughs> and it's it is a whole rabbit hole over here at no simple that's road true. we have some events coming up too um first thing i want to tell you all about is the john t specific northwest run that's getting ready to go down no simple road is presenting the john t up here in the pacific northwest and uh, that's pretty, pretty dope. Where's that going to be? Well, Cam, I, I'll let you know here it's in just a second. At, <laughs> okay, it's going to be beginning up. in, well, if you're quiet, I'll tell you. Okay. Uh, beginning in August, 820, the ruins, Hood River. And Aaron and I, we just went to that place. Super cool. It's awesome. 821 at the High Dive in Seattle. Um, 822 at the Volcanic Theater Pub in Bend. 823 at Talent Club in talent oregon and Where then should be yeah and then 824 good foot portland come on out and then 825 at the big dirty and eugene stay tuned cool. to the no simple road instagram the week before each one of those shows okay so are, about august 15th ish yeah, ish and we will be doing a ticket giveaway for each of them <laughs> and then also check this out if you go to the show and you purchase a poster this is cool these posters are sick by the way it's the space monkey with I the little him. floating uh lion stuffed animal oh and yeah. i'm looking at it right now right. folks mm -hmm. and they're very cool it's they're so not cute. wrong but that very black cool. background on that poster is a maze okay? never get out of this maze when you buy the poster you get a link to a site that gives you a black and white version of the maze and an nft collectible and then you can sol whoever solves the maze submits the maze to this website and they're going to pick winners. There's, I think there's three or four different prizes. One of the prizes is a uh, free jaunty tickets for a year. A year. For solving the maze about that's on the poster. poster purchase. Right. Jeez. Yeah. And it's super sick. So yeah, that is coming up. Make sure to go get your tickets uh, in advance. Don't buy your tickets at the door, man. Don't, don't be that person. Don't do it. No. Uh, and then also no simple road will be podcasting live from fire on the mountain in Denver What on August 28th, the day before the dicks run, we're going to have special guests. We're going to be talking about fish. We might even be doing some trivia. I don't know. We don't know. We'll see. You we just know we're going to be there for sure. So that, and know. then, uh, also no simple road will be podcasting live from cascade equinox festival from the cosmic drip stage. I believe it's Saturday afternoon during that festival so go get your tickets for cascade equinox and if cannot you were, wait yeah if you were there last year at cascade that is the same stage we were on last year so come on we over, had like baby. five people there watching us it was so cool Dude, and you guys had the coolest guest i know <laughs> who was you guys had uh, like that really cool guy i think for your his guest. name was like 
Mr. Cam or something yeah. like that. Mr. Oh Cam? yeah, that's right. That was you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, you mean not? No, I, I mean that is second apple or other. Oh apple. yeah. Oh, gosh, yeah. Aaron. Other apple. You're really blowing it. I with can't this. get it right. <laughs> There it is. Okay. So with that, we are going to get you to the episode. Um, hang on a second. Okay. I had to school cam on the, the note without further. Aaron, I mean, a second apple. Me like that. I fucking Aaron, just need a, a, a it's reminder. It's the other apple. Second apple. Uh, other you. apple. Sorry. Not other even apple. second Thanks, apple. It's the other. Other. Apple. Yeah. All, All right, right. Here we go. Without further ado, the No Simple Rogue crew gives you Eric, Eric Davis. Davis. Hey, look hey. at you. Yeah. We didn't even have to say you're muted or anything. <laughs> Got my headphones on. I think the lighting will take us through. It's going to get darker here, but let me know. Oh, you look great, man. Yeah. I'm, I'm Aaron. Hey, Aaron. How's it going? Good, to, good go, to see you. Going great. Good to see you, too. Uh, my name is Mel. Eric, super excited for this. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Mel. And then rounding out the team, I'm Apple. Thank you for joining us, Eric. Right on. <laughs> um, Eric, for everybody that's listening, would you introduce yourself and tell them why you're here? Yeah, my name's Eric Davis. Um, I'm mostly a writer. I do have a PhD and sometimes teach. Uh, my abiding interests have been alternative religion, subcultures, psychedelics, alternative religion, weird stuff. <laughs> and I've been... Uh, I've been following the beat of the weird for decades as a freelance writer and essayist. And then I um, got my PhD, as I said, and in in wrote a book called High Weirdness, mm -hmm. uh, which was about drug experience and visionary experience in the 1970s in California, talking about Terrence McKenna, Philip K. Dick and some other strange characters. Um, so I kind of walk that line. And I think the reason we're here today is for my latest book, um, which is called Blotter. And it's the first uh, history and sort of uh, archive of LSD blotter art and, and uh, street blotter. So uh, I'm, I'm really so, uh, happy to be talking about the, this book. It's like it was a a dream come true to be able to do it and uh yeah so that's that's me for wow. the moment oh that's a that's a mouthful yeah. um i <laughs> i was extremely impressed with your appearance on the higher side chats with greg uh what an amazing conversation the two of you had and and that's what prompted me to reach out to you and uh then after we had corresponded, I, I ordered the book. I had no idea what it, I didn't know. First of all, it was going to have like the entire history of blotter, <laughs> right? I, I thought maybe it would just be like, you know, a couple of short essays and some pictures. No, this is like the entire history of how Extensive. this medium became a medium and all of it. First off, like, what a weird, you said it already, you've been <laughs> chasing the weird forever, but what a weird thing to f get into the history of blotter. What, what even prompted you to, I'm going to choose that. Yeah, it's, it's funny. This, in this case, it came out of a personal relationship. Uh, you know, the, all of the images you see in the book and a lot of the information uh, comes from the archive and the the brain of Mark McLeod, mm -hmm. who's this very interesting, uh, bon vivant, uh, <laughs> you know, former uh, art professor, MFA, sculptor, photographer, punk rock denizen, old school freak, um, who started collecting blotter in the early 1980s, recognizing that it was like a, a street medium, okay. like that it was its own kind of thing and be, amassed the largest collection o over the decades, but also ended up working in the industry in the in a nutshell. He he put on a blotter art show in San Francisco in the late 1980s and he got a little little sign, you know, written in his book saying, hey, if you want to meet some of the artists 
Chris, you know, give me a call. So he ended up kind of meeting people who were in the underground and he eventually ended up making blotter for the underground. So he did that for a while. He had a couple of uh, uh, pretty hairy uh, legal uh, escapades. He was put on trial that was pretty serious for a while, but he managed to avoid it and, uh, you know, continued collecting and supporting the scene. Um, and I've known him for years and you know, he's pretty open about it. It's like he he calls his collection the Institute of Illegal Images. <laughs> it's just in his house <laughs> in the mission in San Francisco. But, the, you know, it's kind of an open door policy. If you know someone who knows someone, you can just call him up and he's really gregarious and likes to host people. And so people have been writing these little kind of funny, weird um, you know, just little like offbeat news articles since the 90s, you know, like, oh, let's go visit this guy in his weird archive or they make a little short documentary or something. And then at one point I was like, Mark, how come no one's ever done a book? I mean, it's so obvious. And he had had various projects, but they fell through. And so, you know, we were really good friends already, had a lot of respect for each other. And, you know, I needed to have that with him for him to be able to kind of trust me to just yeah. really take it on. Um, so it's partly a fruit of just knowing weird people like Mark McLeod. <laughs> but in terms of my my own like scholarship and, and interests, to be frank, it kind of felt like the universe like set me up like because there's kind of like nobody else could really quite do this the way that it came out because I know about media criticism. I know about the history of the counterculture. I can talk about art and, and you know, uh, iconography. I like doing subcultural ethnography. You know, I, I, ha I have a love of the thing and, you know, a love of LSD. And so it just, it was just sort of the perfect project and it was a pandemic project. So I was able to go uh, totally obsessive. It was like, uh, like I was hanging out with Mark. He was giving me information. I was going through archives. I was talking to people. And I just got obsessed and I said, hey, I think I can actually kind of cover the whole story, you know, with lots of gaps. And I'm sure there's some errors in there because it's no one's really written it before at all. Uh, so it was a real gas to like be able to write about something people hadn't really written about before. So it's like fresh territory. And like you say, it's it's like something that like once you say it, you're like, oh, yeah, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. But even if you love blotter, you just don't think about it that way because it's just a, it's like a vehicle towards towards your mouth. Right. So you're like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's you the middle. It's like you know? the middle man. <laughs> yeah. So you're like, what? You know, it doesn't like. Why would you keep it? In a, so um, yeah. So that and that was you know that's been part of the fun of it as well. It's kind of anomalous, and uh, I like that that feeling. It, of, yeah. Uh, it, a friend friendly anomaly. It it seems <laughs> to me anomaly. that you would almost have to have the pandemic be in full swing in order to do something like that to be the level of obsessive you would have to be due to the clandestine nature of the thing itself there i i can't imagine there's people that are keeping like written record of you know when the first blotter was made or it's right. a lot of hearsay how do you go about like you know, that's a very interesting question. The way that I dealt with it in this case, it was kind of simple, which is that most of the material more or less stems from just a couple sources. Mm -hmm. One mm -hmm. is Mark McLeod. Okay. He has a great memory. He is fascinated with the field and he's been amassing this information, albeit in a kind of more in his head than on the page way for decades. So he had the big picture and some of the, you know, the major players. And then I could tri triangulate by talking to some other people or connecting it with other sources. And sometimes it's just Mark's version of the story. And I'm sure there are other versions. And, you know, there's a joke in the book. It's the subtitle of the book is uh, the untold story of an acid medium. But it's really just a setup for a, a, a comment I make in the book where I say, look, it's really hard to do countercultural history. I'm sure there are things that are wrong in here. In a way, this is just an, the untold story 
untold once again. <laughs> which is a mar- and that's a Mark you know, McLeod line that I just stole from him. I didn't credit him. I said, I'm going to steal this from you, Mark, because it's so funny. And he's like, go, go ahead, dog. You know, he's a character, very generous, very generous guy. So in a way, it's kind of lore, you know, like there's this idea of lore, which yeah. isn't really science. It's not quite history. It's, it's something a little more mythologized. So some of it is history. It's based on, you know, newspaper records, interviews with people who were there. Uh, the One of the major sources actually is that the drug enforcement agency, the chemists who work for the drug enforcement agency and who work in police labs around the country had their own newsletter that started in the 1960s oh. called Microgram. And it was just for the people who were testing drugs, how to test drugs, new drugs on the market, blah, 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 blah. But they just so happened to begin each issue with a kind of roundup of new drugs and interesting drug lore information that was coming in from the bus that around the country. And this was a a, a pretty carefully, you know, hidden document until uh, Sasha Shulgin, who is renowned for bringing MDMA back from the, the past and, 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 and exploring and inventing a lot of psychedelic medicines. He gave a, a few copies of Microgram to the people at Arrowhead. Oh, and yeah. Arrowhead is one of the you know, biggest online repositories of drug information. It's been an you know, independent project since the 1990s, and it has a lot of that spirit of the open internet and open information sourcing. And they managed to like hound together a, a nearly complete collection of this stuff through the mid 1990s. And so I just dove into that, which gave me a, a of, you know, on the street kind of marker of like, here are new formulations. Now we're seeing perforations. Now we're seeing the rise of this and that. And so there's also information in the kind of drug sociology world that helps map out some of the big pictures. So I put it all together. So some of it's lore, some of it's personal accounts, some of it is from newspapers, some of it is from the DEA. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it's a mishmash of, of different you know, historical things. But if you're like someone like me who loves history and likes archives, you know, mm-hmm. it's like exciting to go into an archive. Um, overwhelming sometimes, but also exciting. It, it was just a kind of perfect gas to be able to get, like you say, obsessive about it and go through it. But, you know, there's a lot of calls where I'm like, that's a good story. Or, you know, uh, like the names of them, too. Like they, a lot of them had di- different street names. People call them different things. There's no official name. And a lot of them don't have names at all. So I was like, Mark, what should we call this? He's like, ah, this. I'm like, okay, great. You know, like, so because it's a mess. So, so there's not really, you know, like, here's a good example uh, or a comparison. Rock posters, right? We all know the great, you got rock posters behind you. You know, the great classic hate street, Rick Griffin, Stanley Mouse, da, 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 the big five, all that. Well, at some point, those things were totally ephemeral. You know, they would print them up, they'd put them on the, uh, you know, around the, the town. Occasionally people would steal them and maybe take them back, put them on their wall. They might vend a few, but basically it's an ephemeral form. Right. And then somewhere along the way, someone's like, hey, these are cool. Let's collect them. Let's start buying and selling them. Well, what you need to do is you need to create a whole apparatus so you can say, oh, this one came out at this thing and it had two different printings and you can tell by the the way that the thing is that it was the first printing and it's worth more. And, you know, you need to build a whole kind of like collector apparatus to make it like a thing. And blotter, even though people collect blotter and they've been collecting it, I mean, not just Mark, but in general, since the like late 1990s, um, there isn't one of those apparatuses. You can't like point to someone's page and go, yeah, there's there's five editions of the crazy clowns. <laughs> These are known as Clowns Five. Yeah. Uh, they're artists, uh, this, they manufacturers. No, we don't know it because it comes out of the, the mythical underground. It just appears kind of spontaneously out of this illicit scene. So it's a much more fragile kind of weird object, which is fun, um, but also not entirely... Uh, what do you, what would you say? You can't, can't nail it down. Exactly. It's no, a moving target. The, the thing that, that was, is still really fascinating to me about the whole thing is 
I was a punk rock kid in the eighties growing up in Las Vegas. Right. And there's pages in the book that I had my grubby little hands on back in the eighties. I don't know how that's possible because yeah. that, that means that like somewhere, someplace in the underground somewhere, there was somebody stamping these pages that magically went out to everywhere. And it, that, I think that's the thing that most fascinated me about the book. I was like, Oh shit. I'm we, actually, we both that. recognize Goonie bird. Yeah. We're, yeah, we, yeah we, that's we've a been classic. Friend, Everybody loves the Goonie bird. <laughs> yeah. We, me and him have been friends 40 years now and we did a lot of that together and we used to get, it was, it was cheaper in Las Vegas. There wasn't as much around to buy, <laughs> to buy a sheet. You know, and then yeah. we could sell it to our friends and stuff. That's one of the first I told I Aaron to, today. I was like, first thing I did is, is went through the book and looked at all the pictures. I was excited to see what I recognized, <laughs> you know, yeah. and then it also no, made me think. It, talk about it. They're like, uh, it's like a, you know, photograph uh, going through a photo album. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it creates a timeline and stuff, too. And I, yeah. I know also made me think it's like, man, but we, we didn't have cameras and everything like we have now. It's like, like it's like I wish I had pictures of all the sheets that we had bought in yeah. over the but years. But also and, like, OK, the sheets have to finish at some point. How did we get photos and how are there still sheets around to have? I couldn't think of a more perfect thing to interrupt this episode with Eric Davis than to tell you about our sponsor, Melt Premium Mushroom Chocolates. That's right. Go Melt. to at Melt Mushrooms on Instagram and check out what they have going on. So here's here's the deal. What you're going to do is you're going to follow at Melt Mushrooms. That's with the S at the end. Then you're going to DM them and you're going to be like, hey, No Simple Road sent me. They'll send you their menu, which includes about 10 different chocolates. Gummies. few, Three or four different gummy flavors and even capsules if you don't want to get sugary or if you don't like gummies whatever or whatever. Whatever your trip is. Yeah, whatever you want to do. And for the month of July, you are getting buy one, get one half off from our family over at uh, melt mushrooms and you definitely don't want to shake a stick at buy one get one half off no so go check out at melt mushrooms on instagram throw them a follow shoot them a dm tell them we sent you and do the thing we love you back to our episode sure so mark especially McLeod, in the classics yeah mark mcleod it's 1982 or 83 he's like you know what this is like a popular medium that's just too cool to not collect because he's an artist okay. and he's a collector so he has the collector mind so he started like just stashing it in his fridge and he'd eat it sometimes but sometimes he'd stash it and then at some point he, he started putting them behind glass in frames and that was where that enabled him not to eat it anymore because it's behind the <laughs> pane and then it's on the wall and then you have enough of these things and you put a show together and then you go, OK, this is a thing. Okay. So now I'm actually a collector. I'm going to go out, out and actively try to collect. So, you know, sometimes there would be street runs of acid and they would hold back some paper that was undipped mm -hmm. and they would distribute that. That kind of mm -hmm. came later. But a lot of it would people just put a few sheets here and there. He's got great stories. Not all of them are in the book. Some of them are of just, you know, some guy like unearthed a guitar from his basement from the early 70s. And he forgot that underneath that there was all these pages of like super rare, really early blotter. But because Mark was kind of the like, you know, the, the spider in the web, yeah. like he was like the guy, it would all come to him. And after a while, people yeah. realized that he was, you know, well, one, because he had some underground cred, people knew him on the underground. He worked, you know, he was he was a, he worked in the in the gray market at best. Um, so people kind of knew and respected him. And then they heard that he was a collector. And so once he started working in the underground, he was able to collect even more from all these other characters who might have you know, put some away, this and that, nostalgia, just, oh, I forgot we had this whole batch that we never dipped or whatever it was. So he just was, you know, he was a, a tireless collector who also had a lot of stuff kind of come to him because of what he did. And so, and then at some point, you know, he's a good artist. He knows his stuff. He's got great crew working for him. They just did it really high resolution scans. And a lot of those scans were already, they were, they had already made them when I started the project. So we didn't even need to scan that much. 
we needed to scan a bunch of stuff again, but and some new things. But it wasn't like everything had to be photographed anew because he had already done it, um, you know, years ago. So it's uh, so it was fortu fortuitous, and it really, you know, he there's you know other people who were doing this for sure, but he was kind of the main guy who kind of made the archive. I think the first first time that I was ever exposed to like collector level pages was Zane Kesey yeah. and and Zane's website in the late 90s early aughts mm -hmm. like it he had this like plethora of stuff and you could order pages from him and I think we still have some yeah. running around here somewhere yeah, I have like, a couple yeah. in my room <clears throat> that's really the first time I ever saw it and I and I, I was astounded thinking First of all, the art is beautiful on a lot of these things. And why not keep that art around and preserve it instead of people just eating it and making it disappear? Like, yeah, it, is is there anything that you found out as you were writing the book that really surprised you? Wow, there's so many things that I just didn't know about um, uh, in terms of actually kind of surprising me. Uh, I mean, I, I'm always impressed to to discover how how um high the doses were back in the day mm. um so one of the first uh kind of um mechanized methods of laying out blotter was from the late 1960s with a a chemist and blotter maker named eric ghost and he was some friends and one of them may have actually worked for mit that's something that's not in the book but it was like a real engineer they developed this machine that would take a hundred needles on a peg on a board, dip them into the sauce and then move it as one unit and impress them onto a little card. So you could get a hundred drops or doses in one go rather than going like this a hundred times. Mm -hmm. So it sped up the process, but each drop, like a little drop on a tiny card that's like as big as a business card, each drop was a thousand mics. Holy so shit. you were, you were expected to at least take your scissors out and carefully cut these tiny little dots into quarters to get 250 mic doses. Which is still, <laughs> holy, that's, you're still which going is still way more. For a ride. Yeah. I mean, that's an interesting thing, too, that's really is that one of the funny things about writing about acid is that it's not like other drug markets, it, it has its own culture and in many ways its own distribution networks and its own ma manufacturers so a lot of people who are making the acid that's all they do right. and they make acid and some of them have been deep underground and continuous some labs have been there for a very long time so there's this and and very few of the actual core labs have gotten busted over the years there have been a couple really famous busts but a lot of it's not you know, it's it's a weird little market and then it gets distributed through this strange kind of parallel of other drug markets that doesn't really overlap. There's not a lot of organized crime. There's not a lot of like overlap with cocaine networks and other things like that. They're they're kind of separate in a lot of ways. I mean, on a street level, less so, but like at the higher level. So it's just a funny world to kind of, um, you know, try to try to, you know, describe or even kind of, you know, shape. And so it, it, the blotter has kind of this wacky character because it doesn't, you know, it's not really clear what it does. Right. You know, it's like, it's like, do you need any, do you need to have pictures on the no. <laughs> pieces of paper to sell them? No. Mm -hmm. In fact, some people prefer them to be blank, mm -hmm. both some manufacturers and distributors and some consumers prefer blank blotters. So you don't need them. So it's all art or mediation or goofiness or playfulness or a brand or whatever, all these different ways of thinking about it. And one interesting thing though, about like the, this was, I'd heard rumors of this, but I didn't, but I, it, it's really seems to be the case. At least it's a consistent part of the lore that in the late 1970s. So one of the things that happens in the late seventies is that other formulations of LSD, usually in tablets, press pills, mm -hmm. begin to decline. And it's in the late 1970s that blotter emerges as the most, the dominant medium. 
There's a, there are a lot of reasons for that, people speculate. But one thing that happened is that as that's happening and as acid in a way throughout the 70s just gets spread farther and wider through subcultures and youth scenes and art scenes and everything, uh, um, there was kind of a, a general agreement among the families, so multiple families with their own distribution networks to say, let's lower the dose. So the standard dose of a single hit in the mid 1970s was about 250 mics, mm -hmm. that same amount that we were talking about. Orange Sunshine was 300 mics. That was a little strong. But 250 was kind of a, a standard. And then in the late 70s, they said, no, we're going to bring it down to 100. And it actually changed the mathematics that organized the number of rows and columns on a sheet because you, you wanted to make it easy to handle like so you wanted it to work according to a gram but you had to change the math because you each hit is now less micrograms right so so just the fact that this is an industry where like the competitors would get together and kind of do something that's really sane probably saved a lot of people's brain oh, noodles yeah. you know that was a good move <laughs> uh, to have the yeah. kids the kids in high school taking 100 mic. if they wanted more they just take more yes. but that the, the standard unit was like more reasonable uh, was, a, was, you know, kind of a brilliant move. I also want to say something you said about being a punk rock kid and eating acid. That's one of the stories. I don't go into it too deeply, but Mark himself was a, was really in the punk scene in San Francisco. He like helped edit Search and Destroy. He was friends with V Vale. He knew he was just part of the punk scene. And, the you know, the the relationship between punk and hardcore and LSD is really complicated. And there's kind of a ge generic memory, pop culture memories like, oh, the punks, they didn't like the hippies. Acid was hippie shit. They were into speed or whatever, you know, uh, da, 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 da. And yet, the, and that was true. And my impression is actually that, that some scenes, local scenes, city-based scenes were not very psychedelic. And others were totally psychedelic, Vegas like super was very, psychedelic. Very psychedelic. Vegas yeah. was one of those. I have a friend from Detroit. He's like, no, 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 man. This was like, that was part of what it was about. Mm -hmm. And there are other scenes that were more straight edge or they weren't into the hippie shit. You know, so it's it's kind of a, it reminds us how different scenes had different characteristics back in the day. But the punk rock acid connection is really important to the story because as you as you noted, a lot of the blotter didn't really get going until the early 80s mm -hmm. so it's in those years punk rock industrial music goth music new wave for christ's sakes you know <laughs> not hippie stuff except for the grateful dead which they're continuing to do their thing but in other ways there's all these other subcultures that people are taking acid and it's reflected in the imagery so you got bob dobbs you got these like mirth you know mischievous clowns you you have zippy the pinhead like this is not you know peace and love hippie no. shit it's more like weird and so there's a weird punk dada snarky funny sensibility in a lot of the blotters that reflects this really important non-hippie current of, of acid culture that we don't mostly think about because we just associate it with the 60s well i you could t you could look at bands like the butthole surfers or the flaming mm -hmm. lips and those two mm -hmm. bands to me are the perfect representation of the crossover of acid culture and punk rock yeah that's what you get when you cross those two things but what i saw as a kid growing up then is when the scene itself itself started to explore psychedelics the people inside the scene started to change inevitably fascinating for the most part. I mean, not everybody, of course, but like the edges got a lot softer, pretty damn fast. And <clears throat> I think it speaks to what you're talking about as far as the distribution network goes. Um, I, th I have to believe that the, I don't even know what you would call it, like the vibratory field of being around that much. Like if you're a distributor and you have quantity, there's a, a force with that. That's that's yeah. real. That That's no joke. Yeah. And that stuff, it doesn't lend itself. It's like to, being around diamonds. Yes. 
And it doesn't. You ever go like been around like a pile of diamonds? Yes. You're like, oh my god! Yes. It's like that's like that's some shit. You know? And it doesn't lend itself to cocaine and whiskey. It just doesn't. As that easily. that field kind of pushes that out. And and the people that are taking the risk, time, and using their talent to do that have obviously figured out that that thing is important to get out. So they've seen from the inside what it is. So I think that's why that adversarial nature doesn't exist as much at the, at the level you're talking about that, that there's mm, more cooperation. Mm-hmm. At least that's my thought. Yeah. I think they both go on. I mean, there's definitely competition and backstabbing and, you know, sure. drug, drug, druggy business, but there's also this other, more playful utopian kind of current that runs through it or 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 at least as i said like play, playful and mischievous i mean that's part of the other weird thing about unusual thing about the acid distribution that it, that has an impact on the blotter is that in the 1980s and especially in the late 80s and the early 90s the distribution mechanism for lsd in america was Grateful Dead tour. Oh, I, so tour, oh, I know it. you know, and it wasn't just on the street level. Like it wasn't just that you could go to the parking lot and you find someone and then oh, they could get by a sheet and bring it back to your high school or whatever. Like that's of course going on or, or, you know, do it that night or whatever. But on the upper level is that the higher level people would use the kind of goofy weirdness of Grateful Dead tour as a, almost like a kind of shield, labyrinth of mirrors to do really high level business. So you had people like dealing with crystal in the rooms and, you know, laying out tons of sheets and like, so it, it became kind of part. And so it has some of that carnivalesque grateful dead tour, crazy, playful, goofy weirdness going on that kind of, it, it kind of informs the whole, the whole, uh, you know, economy mm-hmm. of the thing, which is just part of the the flavor that it's got. I, I mean, this is just going to be your own opinion, but do you think that that could have happened without the Grateful Dead, that level of distribution and even interest? And That's oh, oh. a great question. That is a great question. I would say if there was not another band that was kind of functioning like the Grateful Dead. And in the 1980s, I think it's pretty easy to imagine that there wouldn't have been, like if the Dead hadn't been there, it's not like there would have been a fish in 1982 right. popping up. It, it might just not have really have happened. There might be like the Allman Brothers or this or that, but it it wasn't going to have that quality. And so I can imagine that that actually it would have been a, diff- a fundamentally different, certainly in the 80s. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe through the early nineties without, without the debt, because it, it really did become, you know, a kind of marriage of, of convenience and shared, shared sensibility. And of course it was a weird, uh, uh confusing moment when Jerry died. Cause it was like, well, what's going to happen now? And in a way it's not really accidental that you see the sort of emergence of larger festivals in the late nineties and you got like the further tour, you know, there's a whole relationship between like, where does the energy of the dead tour go and how does it like create a larger jam bandy world that is capable of being a place for other things that continue to happen. Cause it was, it was confusing for a lot of people. It caused a rupture. It was, it was, yeah, it did put a wrinkle in things it was confusing enough that we both took a long hiatus yeah, from <clears throat> from everything we, yeah. yeah in 95 it was kind of like oh what do we do now and it but, was a while well, yeah it, that just, we did it again the grateful dead is so i mean you they're so it. specific you know they're their own thing and yeah now there's of course tons and tons of grateful dead tribute bands and like there's fish and there's there's a culture behind touring with bands but that I don't know that that was really well, as popular or as maybe full as when the Grateful Dead did it. And it seems as if there's a lot of economy and just a lot of different artistry and things that have were born out of that that really couldn't have been born out of anything else other than that or yeah, something I mean, so adjacent, you know? That, that's interesting thought. I, I think you could 
you know, and this is just kind of guessing, like, I'd feel like I'd want to talk to my friend Jesse Jarno, who wrote the wonderful book Heads, which is a history of psychedelic America, not not the famous name so much as the scenes, mm-hmm. including the dead, is that you, you'd a way the, the like the way that the dead, you know, helped produce like a taping culture, like this technical taping culture that didn't exist in any other yeah. world. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, uh, you know, so they had that whole kind of, you know, uh, economy that they, that their existence allowed the acid industry and even blotter to develop in a certain way that it wouldn't have otherwise, you know, would have been there, would have been available, but it, it flavored it, it twisted it in a, in a certain way, I I suspect. Yeah. Cause even like the, like the, um, steely or tie dye, I mean, maybe that, I mean, in the 60s, that was popular, but it really seemed as if that, it just, it couldn't have lasted. I, I should say, well, it's a better way I, of I saying it. I think the thing that we haven't brought up is the CIA was very, at least from what I understand, who knows if anything's true anymore. <laughs> um, but the CIA was actively involved in, in assisting getting the LSD trade going. Isn't Isn't that what you understand? I well? would say that that's, I would say it's a it's a complicated question. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, you know, that the CIA, you can find the greasy fingers of intelligence agencies running throughout the story because part of what their uh, modus operandi was was to or is to some degree is uh to fuck with shit. <laughs> so, it's not like it's not like they're sitting there at at the top corporate office of the CIA and it's like a top-down pyramid where the decisions are made up top and they go let's distribute LSD to all the hippies that's not how it works it's a much more distributed anarchic organization where there's lots of little bands that are kind of doing their own thing and they kind of report to someone but it's not really clear but part of their job is to just go around and fuck with shit because they're the CIA, right? And they're gathering information and it's this whole kind of, it's like a weird theater. So in that world, absolutely things were, were, were going on. Were they actively supplying their stories about, you know, where did the check LSD that floods the scene come in in the late six, da, da, da. you know, there's definitely stuff and you can go down those, those um, paths. My personal feeling is that when I look at people who are trying to actually do it in a historically rigorous way, most of the evidence that I would want to see, I don't really quite see. Um, and I, and I, and there's a tendency to kind of c- create this big, Oh, the CIA is doing it. And the whole psychedelic movement is a creation of the CIA and they're <laughs> doing it to do this certain purposes. Like that's not, that's not how history works according in, in my sense of it. And I say that as somebody who studied mm-hmm. history, like, I just don't think it works that way. It's more, history is much messier Ambiguous. and there's U.S competing factors and within an organization there's this left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing and it's it's not that there's not you know evil shit that's happening i mean certainly mk ultra was like seriously evil shit yeah. and they were they were and presumably are doing some version of that they kind of have to because their enemies might be doing it so that's just part of the logic um so yeah, so it's it gets it gets weird, you know. It gets weird when you start thinking about, uh, you know, how, what what all these rela- you know kind of relationships are. But you know, I also think it's like the dead were just kind of doing what they could get away with. Basically. Yeah, no, I, right. I, I I don't think there was, uh, as far as the dead were concerned, they were just Jerry said it a lot of times. They're just following the fun and just trying to keep keep things going. After, well, but there's after yeah. also of time. rumors but, of them even being involved yeah, with themselves. Yeah. With Bob the Weir, Bohemian well. Grove, and all that stuff. But like, oh yeah, no Bohemian Grove, sure. Yeah. But. Um, but if if that was the case, and it was you know some thing where they're like, let's distribute LSD to the hippies and see what if we can fuck them up. Well, you guys blew it because cat's out of the bag, <laughs> and that that experiment is. Fucked. <laughs> or, or is ongoing. Oops. Well it's done. Ongoing. Yeah. Or it was the one cool dude in the CIA <laughs> that was like, "Oh, I'm gonna have fun." Eric, with this. what's your relationship to the Grateful Dead? Like your personal. Um, one. Oh yeah. I mean, I I saw them uh, I, the first time. I think in Ventura County Fairgrounds in 1984. Uh, so I went to 
I was never like a full tour head, but I'd see them whenever I could when I was around, wherever I was around. So I saw, I don't know, I probably saw them 50, 60 times. <laughs> Um, I, I wasn't a full life. tour head, but I saw him like 50 <laughs> times, man. Yeah. I yeah. <laughs> well, over the day, de- you know, I had a good decade in front of me there. And, uh, and yeah, so no, I, I, I was definitely into it. You know, um, I, 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 yeah, it's, I could talk about the Grateful Dead for, for a long time and about psychedelics and psychedelic religion and all that kind of stuff. I think it's really interesting. But, you know, I'm looking at the, the steely be- on your wall there. And that was a fun thing that I realized is that the, the the 13 point bolt is acid like i never quite figured that out i just thought it was like whatever like a cool symbol or da 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 but if you go back it's like why did why did ozzy call it white lightning so he's he brews up a batch in early 1967 because it's going to be the human being in san francisco so they he you know and one of the things about acid also that's interesting is that sometimes batches are whipped up for a particular event, like they're aimed towards a particular thing, you know, not just tour maybe, but like Burning Man or the Renaissance Fair or Rainbow Gathering or whatever. So Oregon it's country fair. There's kind of a it's got an event quality in it, almost like a like a rock poster. It's like you got the little mm. oh, we're going to print them up and we're going to print these up and these are going to go into this thing. So Owsley's doing that makes a batch early 67 it's going to be the and what's he going to call it he's he's already made got a you know he's got blue cheer he's already got some other names mother's milk da 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 and he sees the rick griffin poster for the bn and the indian's holding these lightning bolts he goes okay white lightning and so the lightning bolt becomes this weird kind of like masonic symbol in a way for the acid and so you see that get played out in a lot of the blotters so there's like different kind of uses of the lightning ball and it just makes so sense so whenever i see the steely now i have this different sense of it which is that it's not as flat to me anymore now it looks it's a little more it's got more depth because it's got like kind of a secret on the surface Mm. and when you say you're like okay sure it's the skull on acid what's the big deal but you're like no it's it it's it's a little more magical because of the way that that symbol kind of functions well and, and you it, can see it in the water. if you think about the multitude of psychedelic imprint that has been placed on that symbol over years there's power in that thing people putting pouring their tripping mind into a symbol i mean that's Isn't that how like the mother languages work, like with Sanskrit and Hebrew and that like those shapes have intention and will poured into them over centuries. And then those things. That's why. Yeah, that's why it's so cool that they they didn't overly attempt to control the, the image, at least for a long time. And so people could do modification parodies satires you know like you've seen them steal these with everything instead of the lightning bolt you know it's like a black panther from the black panther party or it's like san francisco giants or whatever like you can twist it in all these different ways so it's like it's the the symbol has a lot of intensity and power but it's also kind of like distributed and playful too like it's not all just focused on that one oh it's this symbol we're controlling it you can only use it in this way <laughs> So it's it's part of the fun of the whole thing. I kind of always it's kind of open ended as a instead of a bolt as a crack, and it's an open mind. Yeah, I've <laughs> seen that too. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've had that thought too. Yeah. That's great. Um, you know, in sitting down to write a book about the history of blotter, you you can't separate that from the the drug itself. And you mentioned something earlier that I'm really curious about that I don't know the answer to. Why did we switch from pills to blotter? Mm. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting one. I think, you know, there's there's different attempts to account for it. Um, one of the popular ones is that there's less weight mm. with blotter than there is with pills. And so the carrier weight laws are less draconian. It's a good story, but it doesn't really line up um, with the, the, the dates because those carrier weight laws come in a little bit later than blotters already succeeded. So I think it has to do with the convenience factor. Um, 
You don't need a, pre a pill press machine. You can actually kind of, you just need your silk screen. Oh, I got a silk screen machine. Or you go, you have a friend who works at the copy shop and you just go and use the offset printer. And, you know, like it, the, the gear is less kind of dodgy. Mm -hmm. And I also just think that there's something fun about the medium that people were like, yeah, this is kind of fun. It's like putting out a comic book or, you know, make it stand. <laughs> yeah. Like it's just, it's just a little more fun. And it's just really easy to get around the world too. You know, like, you know, I talked to somebody, a blotter maker um, in, in the, in Amsterdam who made a lot of really well-known pieces in the kind of late, late eighties, but mostly in the 1990s, beautiful pieces, very different kind of quality, very European in a way. And he talked about they just sent them all over the world. He had a person who knew how to bind books and he, they would just, you know, make a gap in the cardboard of a cover of a book and just, you know, put in 10 sheets, boom, all over the world, you know, so it's like, uh, uh, sorry, it's, just, Eric, it's easy. That thumbs down wasn't for you. <laughs> did yeah, it no, it's okay. you said, that's so weird. <laughs> I know they're just, it's, it's the, the imps. Yes. The gremlins yeah. are going, eh, meh, meh, meh. No, I'm going to give them a thumbs down. Yeah. Oh, I, on, <laughs> on, the, on the back of that question, too, I'm curious because it made me think about it. In the mid-80s, all of a sudden, too, and it seemed like it came from a different source when we started getting, we got window pane and stuff right. for a little bit. It was like there were smaller sheets and it was the gel, which in Las mm -hmm. Vegas in the summertime, yes, the gel, no bueno. we ended up Has getting issues. like a little too much than we meant to take by handling it and it getting gooey, but it wasn't around for long. It, it is. Do you know anything about that? I mean, and it yeah, seemed I mean, like that, different stuff. That format, yeah, that format starts in the, in the early, in the early seventies. Um, and we know the crew that did it, like one of them, uh, you know, there's a book about him. He actually became a Zen monk later on. It's a fascinating story. Um, and, uh, so yeah, they were, they wanted to make really high quality LSD and they wanted to put it in a distinctive format and they figured out you could do this kind of gelatin form. And there were multiple people who did gel, you know, gel forms and, you know, there were pyramids and micro dots, which are kind of related in terms of the material, a little bit different feel to the to the kind of squares of window paint. And then they would just come in periodically. Like I remember the batch that came through in the early 1980s and it was just there for a spell and not there anymore. And I'm not really sure if that reflected like ongoing production or people were sitting on a, a load of it or how, you know, kind of how that worked. And people are doing it today, too. I mean, there's a lot of like classic format yeah. that people are kind of interested in today. So like there's a lot of, there's a lot of gelatins um, in different forms uh, that, that are, are out there. So yeah, that's I've another seen, medium. I've seen some running around I, the, I can't, I can't remember his name. Roshi. Oh, damn it. I'm blanking on his name. He took an entire like crystal himself and this is the guy that became a zen buddhist monk later on down the right road. dennis kelly dennis kelly that's it and that's the family that started the gel yeah whoa yeah i didn't know yeah that. dennis Ke yeah dennis kelly was part of the original crew and i think they were they were around north beach and i think it's in the very end of the 60s very early of the 70s and they were partly because part of the problem was that people dissociated the the pressed pills by the early 70s with kind of bunk like there was a lot of bad acid you know oh it had strychnine in it or right. it was made shitty or whatever and so there there was a lot of adulterants in some of the pills some of the pills were, weren't very good so there was a general sense that the pills were kind of low quality mm -hmm. and at the time coming out with a different kind of format where the whole branding was like this is clear it's clean oh. clear light window paint so it's got a different format so they went kind of high end but it it worked so they made they were very successful um and it was also part of when people did blotter it was also like seen some and sometimes as being higher quality because it wasn't just the normal pills later on people would start to go yeah but it's you're handling it with your hands and it kind of breaks it down it's not the ideal format probably but handled well you know, it's as good as anything, probably. You know, well, so. then, then that's where it, came, it kind of came along. That was that early 90s when we got 
when we got the, the connection, who was a very strange person that lived down her. in LA from dead to her, got our first, like, you know, the food coloring bottle of liquid. And it was like, Oh, oh it was yeah. like the Holy grail. Yeah. When he came back from LA, I have liquid. Well, I mean that way, yeah, you yeah. know what you're getting and well, yeah. for the most part, it, it, you, you know, know. I, the, but the, I'm glad you mentioned food coloring. Cause that's one of the great stories of acid media lore. And it, it's not lore because I mean, it definitely happened. Tim Scully confirms it. Owsley talks about it. It was it. So Owsley made a, a batch of crystal and he divided up the same batch and he used different food coloring on the on the piles, made a bunch of press pills. They hit the street and in if in some time, whatever, weeks, mo- a couple months, whatever. They get different reps. Like the green ones make you really peaceful. The red ones are super spiritual. Like they begin to get different associations and people think they kind of function differently, but it's the same crystal. And that raises this really interesting question because remember, right? Set and setting people. Mm -hmm. The mind frame, the expectations you have, the narratives, the, the hopes, the fears, and the environment you're in are actively contributing to the nature of your experience. Well, if that's true, the format that the drug comes in is part of that environment. Yeah. You know, if I take a big old pink pill, that's different than a little square with like Bart Simpson slingshot on it <laughs> versus, <laughs> you know, pure wow. water in a, in a, in a, in a, an eyedropper that I just put in my hand. Like those are different environments that have different kind of implications, but it's hard to say exactly what they are, you know? So blotter's also funny that way. It's like, does it make a difference? Does it make a difference if you take a UFO piece? Ooh, maybe you're opening up the portal to the UFO. You're going to have more likely to have a close encounter with your experience. Maybe, I don't know. We have, it'd be hard to test it, but it does makes a little, makes a certain sense given set and setting, given the the role that the mind plays in telling a story. So the food coloring experiment is a really good uh, example of the placebo dimension of, of, of psychedelics of, of LSD. And And that's really cool too. Like the scene created these out of it, like, like like green could have been at a dead show and the blue could have, that's a trip. Well, and like, what about like color therapy? You know, taking a green one as and then a blue one, you in your own mind or just the the, the vibratory color has an effect, Absolutely. like you said, of that set and setting. So you take a blue one, you're like, oh my god, you know, I'm going to outer space. Oh, Jesus, yeah, whatever, like. <laughs> And like like the mid, like orange sunshine that just yeah. has a moniker about it, oh, it always itself. has well there's such a gr- such a great brand but i mean just just to take a moment and just appreciate what a great brand name that is oh, i mean yeah. it's just the best it's like <laughs> it's like a bubble gum and each endless summer and you know it's just so much bound up in that in that one yeah how how, how did you enjoy enjoy it at fair apple i don't know what's that orange sunshine <laughs> it was. It was, it was, yeah. okay yeah. i knew it was something i was <laughs> yeah um eric i well i'm um, i'm just curious like how did you you know you clearly are a scholar a phd how did you get interested in this stuff like it seems kind of opposite i never st- I never stopped being interested in it. You never stopped. So I went through my whole, like I was all, you know, like being a a deadhead, acid head teenager in Southern California was a very important part of my life that in some ways I never grew up from. Like as I went forward and then, you know, got a degree and then became a freelance writer, I was just always still kind of like ref kind of into that domain so i wrote about psychedelic culture in the 90s i wrote about taking drugs you know i yeah. when when it wasn't cool like now it's the coolest thing now it's so cool it's boring but like <laughs> yeah. in the 90s it was not cool it was not cool to be like hi i'm a i'm a you know i'm a journalist and i'm gonna talk about drugs it's like whoa, whoa dude that's yeah, dude. Well, take you, it easy, you know yeah. watch that shit yeah. take it easy buddy so i was always interested in it and um you know interested in a lot of different kind of stuff uh, so, um, you know, it stayed with me. So when, like, I finally decided to do a PhD, I went to a, I, my degree is in 
religious studies, but I went to a um, department that had a open enough idea about what religion was that I could write about psychedelics and weird underground stuff in California in the seventies and have it count. Like a lot of places I'd go and they'd say, no man, it's gotta be a real religion like Catholicism or, you know, Santeria or whatever, even Santeria would be kind of weird. Like you can't just like write about drugs, but I went to a place that I, I was supported in being able to do that because I really wanted to do a project. It's not even just about drugs. It's really just about what, what do we do when we have like experiences that are so far beyond the norm, we don't know where to put them. Yeah. And if we try to make too much meaning out of them, we'll probably go crazy or go down a rabbit hole. But at the same time, it's like you, you've been changed and you yeah. don't really know what to do with that. And so I, I write about that problem with like Terrence McKenna and Robert Anton Wilson and uh, Philip K. Dick, who wasn't a psychedelic person. He only took psychedelics a few times, um, but he's, he was kind of naturally trippy in his brain. And he had like these really far out experiences. So it's it's not just about drugs. It's also just about what do we do with these really extreme, weird experiences? So, yeah, I want to explore. The, one, one of the first things I, first of all, I, went, I was going to say thank you for your your involvement in it. When Aaron said he was going to reach out to you, I immediately, you know, we start to look. So I was like, this is one of the guys that was involved in the glitch in the Matrix. That, that And that's another avenue of just exploring the world. And that that's a fascinating that. I, I love the animation, like everything about that. I, I immediately yeah, that was, was like, like, okay, I'm, I, I found, I found it streaming was like, okay, I need to watch this again. It's been a little bit of time and that is amazing. Yeah. Well, and- yeah, yeah, no, I, I mean, I've, I've been interested in technology too. And, you know, in a way drugs are kind of like internal technologies in a, in a weird way, especially something like LSD. It's very media. It's very tech. It's very modern. You know, it's a modern drug. It's not, it's not from the jungle. It's not from the mountains of Oaxaca. It's from a chemical lab in the middle of uh, Europe. So it's it's got a different sort of set of spirits associated with it that have, in a way, more to do with our modern world. That's partly why, like, the question of the spooks is so absolutely central to LSD. It's like to the LSD world to enter into the walk through the door into the LSD world, you're walk you you are agreeing to wrestle with spooks. Mm-hmm. It's part of the picture. You can't avoid it. It's part of the thing. However, you end up landing. Whereas you can go and like go down. You know, I'm gonna do an ayahuasca path, and I'm gonna go down to Peru, and I'm studying with a master, and I'm you know doing that whole thing. Now you might you know go through all sorts of crazy wild places and paranoias and all kind of stuff. But it's got a different flavor because from the get-go, acid belonged to the system first. So it belonged to corporations, Mm. psychiatrists, the intelligence agency. You know, that's, you know, the the people who are, you know, that's the people who are like, what are we going to do with this stuff? And some of them were good people. Some of them were were not good people. But that's and then it kind of leaks out of that and goes broad and into psychology and hipsters and bohemians and people in Hollywood. And then it goes in the 60s and it becomes this mass kind of thing. And so it it carries its own set of vibes Mm -hmm. to it. And and some of that that I think is actually really positive and interesting. And some of it adds a kind of coloring to the drug like i i've talked to younger people who are like yeah i'm not i'm not interested in lsd it's it's too it's too cia you know i'd rather do organic you know i want to do mushrooms right. or whatever and i'm like oh i kind of see why i could see where you why you would think that i mean i it, you know whatever I mean, it, so it's it, it has its own kind of story because it's sort of more like a technology or a new media that gets developed inside the West inside, you know, capitalism inside uh, media culture. And that's why it makes sense that it has kind of its own media. Like none of the other drugs get that. No, you know, no, they you only have... acid gets this media where it's like, there's, <laughs> there's a clown on it. Why is there a clown on my drug? I don't know. <laughs> you know? I felt like it. Well, <laughs> the last thing I just wanted to ask about is Alembic. And is that kind of like your, way of like seva. bleeding the two together or your your seva or your help or like I, i'm wondering where like yeah how, yeah how no, that- that's a really good question yeah so the, the 
the Alembic is is a kind of we, we still haven't come out with a great way of describing it because it's a it's an eclectic operation, but let's call it a sort of uh, a, a center of meditation and visu- visionary culture, Med- meditation movement and visionary culture. So we have stuff on on meditation, consciousness, contemplation, lots of movement stuff, but also a lot of attention to psychedelic wisdom and um, especially currents and ideas that we think will help the situation. I mean, you mentioned Seva, and you know, one of the things that's happening right now is the world's insane. Everyone's going crazy. There's drugs everywhere. Everyone's going for it. Like, it's not like, it's like, yeah, I can use technology, AI and tons of, and, you know, whatever, ayahuasca and, and uh, you know, breath work. And it's just, you know, everything is just going off. Yeah. So it's very, very confusing for people. And so what and we're trying to do, yeah, it's exciting. It's an exciting, weird confusing time. And so what we're trying to do is create some sense making in that space and give people tools that help them kind of navigate and also to chill out or balance and not get, get loopy because, you know, I'm, you know, psychedelics, it's very easy to get loopy. You know, it's really easy to start believing your own narrative, fall into a narrative, fall into an idea that you're special, um, magical thinking coincidences start taking over your life and you know the thing about coincidences or synchronicities you guys gotta remember like a couple synchronicities are awesome Mm -hmm. usually funny life affirming there's a deeper plan i feel like that but you start getting them like that that's psychosis (laughs) you do not want synchronicities coming like that oh my gosh so never even thought of like that yeah. yeah no that's like but that you know so it's a, it's like a little bit of an edgy situation we're in. So I think it's also real important for those of us who are, you know, in the space of creating media and, and creating ideas to like, you know, take on the weird possibilities, but also be extra careful of like kind of keeping your feet on the ground and remembering there's always that morning after and yeah. the morning after is just as enlightening as the peak the night before. It's like they're both they're both part of the picture and it's about a practice over time. Whereas a lot of, I think younger people, especially they see the peak and they're like, that's it. I want to go back there. Or like, uh, now I, I realize I'm the one and I see, and here's how it's all working. And, and they go online, they go on Instagram and then they have followers. And it's like, no, 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 no. Mm-hmm. Like that's not, you know, there's a lot of that. So it's, yeah. it's a very weird time. And so the Alembic is our attempt in, in a real place, you know, in a physical place where people have to go, we have some stuff online and we have a YouTube stream and things like that, but we're not really putting our energy there right now. It's really like, can we create, get people out of their, their little holes, back into spaces with each other and work on practices and approaches and ideas and, and community that can sort of pr- provide a little bit more grounding for people and a context to be able to let them navigate what's pretty confusing, you know, I mean, especially I think for, for younger people. I, for everybody. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's well, but when we're older, we're like, yeah, we but we can kind of ride. Yeah. It's true. We got, we, true. Got our, we got our inheritance and we're kind of riding it. <laughs> and so way back of there, there's some of it is this kind of like grounded analog. You know, you were, you were in Vegas. Vegas wasn't LA. It wasn't no. Detroit. It was Vegas. It was in a place and you had the culture and the local people and you figured out how to, you had to do this to get to know these people and you lucked out over here and you know, that whole kind of world. And like people now they there's no, that doesn't really exist. So it's, yeah. it's all signals and messages and big, you know, patterns of information and polar, you know, polarization and meme warfare. And it's just so ungrounding. So I, I kind of feel like gri- grizzled old analog dogs, like <laughs> the four of us, you know, we have a, it not so like we have an edge. We're just as confused. Uh, in some ways we're even more handicapped because we're like, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> but, <Yes. laughs> but, uh, but there's also kind of a, a sense of continuity that sometimes you can, you can access that I think other, other people find uh, challenging. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, thanks for that question though. I appreciate it. Yeah. I, because I was reading the write up on it. Um, and first of all, it's beautiful. I love what you wrote about it on, on the website, but it, it's, it seems like 
it's needed, but like, what exactly is it and, and why? And then that's <laughs> kind of what right. I was, totally makes sense, it was though. a great yeah. explanation. So what exactly <laughs> is it is a great question. <laughs> I, th- I have a feeling, I have a feeling if we could answer that in one sentence, it would be too limiting. Oh, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. You know, I, I just, never... sometimes we call it a mind body center, which is like an old kind of seventies, eighties term. And we're, not, we're all like, yeah, that's, it's not right, but you know, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to name it. Cause we don't really have things like that. It's definitely not a religion. <laughs> it's a light- I, I <laughs> Why don't you just call it a lighthouse? There you go. It's, it's a place a to light come Yeah, out. exactly. It's a light. A lighthouse you crash on the I rocks, like man. Just come, come hang out. Over here. <laughs> I, it's I, a grounding pad. I really never thought <laughs> yeah. I would see the day when people would be saying, oh yeah, I microdose LSD to be more productive at my corporate job that to me is like bizarre bizarro world ex- personified outward a million times and that that kind of shit is confusing to me because but I, you know but it, it's it, but it's there too though like if you go back and you go okay where where's the grateful dead coming from and where are the where's the the acid tests and the and the and the merry pranksters coming from they're coming from palo alto they're coming from the peninsula right in california in the mid 1960s well that same world includes like stanford research institute it includes these other kind of institutes of people including my, uh, this fellow named myron stoloroff who's a cool guy worked for ampex worked in silicon valley as an executive was interested in lsd and what what some of these people were interested in back in the 60s was like hey can, can this help people do their jobs better can this help architects imagine but not in a like it gets me through the day or i'm able to be a better you know run it's more like the big picture right. like can acid help you actually design you know a complex system of architectural system or can it help you come up with new mo- molecular forms or help you design better computer chips or you know can it basically enhance that kind of innovation can acid fuel innovation and that idea is already in silicon valley in the 1960s at the same time Wow. wow. That the counterculture is exploding. So it was so, far from uh, only the yeah. counterculture. And, and I think that goes speaks yeah. back to what yeah. he, he was saying a while ago is that the molecule itself comes from inside the machine. Yeah. So it lends itself mm. wow. to that. It's, thing. It has its, it, it, it's a very, it's a, it's a trickster. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, you are an excellent teacher. Yeah, man. You are a super fun person to talk to. And I just appreciate all the research <laughs> that you've done into the, like topics that w- I've loved my whole life, but Again, they're not like out in the front. Now, you said it earlier. Yeah. Now it's annoying and boring almost. <laughs> like we've talked about that ad nauseum about like, remember when it was fun to smoke weed? You know, but yeah. now, but like, I just want to like say thank you. Like, honestly, that I really feel like you are doing a huge boon to the culture, not just counterculture, but to our culture, because we're part of that culture. So, yeah. and, and it's grown. So it's kind of not counter anymore. Yeah. So I just want to thank yeah. you for that. No, it's that. not really. It's, right? Well, I really appreciate you saying that. That I really, that, that's that's meaningful to me. Thank you for, for saying that. It's, yeah. it's, it's kind and I, I appreciate it. Uh, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a lot of fun too. It's been, uh, you know, I've been doing it for a long time. And it's, so it's funny at this, at this era where everything is so different, um, you know, to, to share, to share some of this stuff. Uh, it's important. Yeah, yeah I, it I really think, is. I think I can speak for the three of us too. I, I, we're just scratching the surface of Eric. Oh, oh yeah, we, 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 we would love. I, mean, I would love to. It have would be Eric cool on. to check back in with you every well, once I, in a while, whenever you have something else going on, or just to hang out and talk. I would love well, to talk. To I would love yeah, to yeah, specifically been, talk about religion too. That's yeah, another thing yeah. that we've all been very interested in. We didn't even talk talk about that because we wanted to yeah. maintain the blotter, but that would be super cool to be able to pick your brain on that. Yeah, no, it's been really fun chatting. So I appreciate it. It's been, right, it's been great. Thank you, Eric. Hey, <laughs> okay. for, for everybody listening, if you want to get Eric's book, um, I am going to put a link to that in the show notes and, uh, a link to Alembic as well. 
Also, I also I have a I have a sub stack. It's not very frequent. It's a cu- couple times a month. It's called Burning Shore, and uh, and you know so I, I, and you know I've I've written about the dead a couple times on there. A bunch of stuff, kind of psychedelic culture stuff from a California perspective, um, and that, so that's BurningShore.com. Okay, and it's, a, it's a good way to keep up with what I'm doing too. Right, right on, on, Eric. Thanks, man. We appreciate your time, brother. Yeah. Thank you. All right. right Thanks on, a lot. Man. I really Lisa, appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good night. You, you too. too. Bye. Aw. See, I, kn- I knew. I, I just knew it. I knew it when I heard him on, on Greg's you know show that cool. it was going to be dope. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. And we Listen, just, our booker is pretty we, incredible. Okay. Yeah, we just scratched the surface of blotter. And stuff. There's so many other books I wanna, he's written and things he's done. And I want to talk to him about Robert Anton Wilson for like seven hours. I, and yeah. Alistair Crowley. Hey, you want to come hang out at the No Simple yeah. Roadhouse? Eric, there? you have an invitation. Yeah, open, open come invitation. Up to Portland, come Oregon. hang out. We'll make you dinner. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we All love right. to host. Yeah, um, yeah. Go, go check out this book. It, it yeah. is. It is, a, it is called Blotter, The Untold Story of an Acid Medium by now, Eric Davis with a K, Eric. But the, the story is now told. Yeah, it's told, but kind of. Right. <laughs> In a lore, right. mystical kind of a way with wow. as much truth as we can I, find. I'm going to I'm gonna say something controversial what? right now. And, and two of you are going to give me shit for it, but I'm going to say what? it anyway. That was my favorite interview that we've done in a while. Like, not that the other ones sucked and I didn't like them. It's not controversial. That, we decided was, the other day we're allowed to have opinions. We, oh, yeah, we are? We're, we're allowed, allowed to have opinions on No yeah. Simple Road. Sweet. You said it. I okay. can't give you shit for yeah. that. This is yeah, totally that was my engaging favorite. Yeah, why and would interesting. we give you shit? That's, I mean, he's, like, Mel, I meant Mel. that. Dude, you're dumb. Why would oh you God. say Our, that? So Everybody we've got even such Darwin. cool other we'll people. Be back Darwin came over here staring at you bug-eyed. With like, another <laughs> episode of No Simple Road. Well, and, wait a minute. Or we maybe just, not. Let's just I don't say know. it nice. This is getting rocky. Oh, no. no, this... <laughs> What's um, up, buddy? What I what oh, I was gonna I say know. is no. This was super important to all of us because we've been in the quote unquote counterculture for most of our marriage, most of your life, and to be able to speak not only candidly but intelligently and with facts and also just also your memory about what happened, what's happening. That's it, it's really helpful. Like it's yeah. internally helpful. Mentally, yeah. internally helpful. Well, and and to sometimes talking to PhDs and that ilk can be uh, a little overwhelming or intimidating. And that was the antithesis of either of those things. No, from the I, first know. sentence he spoke, immediately like, felt oh, comfortable. He's a like, yeah, yeah, like, oh, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure he can roll the other way too. Oh, yeah. Oh, you <laughs> should him roll the other Petty way on AF. some stuff. Yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 But we're not doing that over here. Um, okay. We'll, we'll be maybe back on, on another Monday. episode with him. And, oh. and, That's right. And uh, it, until that time, as such, when our voices come through your ear pods or whatever they're coming out of, could you take care of each other? Yeah. Smile at a stranger and safety third, hydrate and, and make sure that, that you test all of your, your stuff before you put it in your body. You know, test what? before you ingest. If you enjoyed this episode, send Eric some love, email yeah. him, let him know that you enjoy this because it's always nice to tell people that you appreciate them. This is true. And check out everything. Eric can say Eric has done a lot. All right. There it is. We love y'all. Peace. But it's a tad bit of strange similarities that feed an A equal A complex.
complex. The fears of your past do not equal the perplexities of the current road. Hi, this is Henry K, host of the number one music history podcast, Rootsland. Come with me on a journey to Kingston, Jamaica, where we explore the world of reggae music and the untold stories of some of the genre's greatest legends. From the ghettos and tenement yards where the music was born to the island's iconic recording studios. We are so excited to team up with Osiris Media, the leading storyteller in music. Because as you'll hear, sometimes the story is the best song.